Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we're doing the Piersonet Excel International A Level, Biology Unit 6 for October 2023. Let's begin with the first question. Question 1. The photograph shows fruits on a camu camu tree. This is the tree they're talking about. So down here they say, camu camu trees grow in the Amazon basin of South America. The fruits have a very high vitamin C content. In part A, the student found the vitamin C content of camu camu fruits changed with the length of time in storage. Freshly picked fruits had a main vitamin C content of 2,400 milligrams per 100 grams. After being stored for 28 days, the main vitamin C content was 1,848 milligrams per 100 grams. They wanted to calculate the percentage decrease in vitamin C found in the camu camu fruits after 28 days. To calculate the percentage decrease, we need to first find the decrease which is going to be the original concentration minus the concentration after 28 days. So subtracting that and that, I get 552 grams. And the percentage decrease is 552 divided by 2,400 times 100, giving me 23%. In part B, the student read that the vitamin C content of this fruit decreased the most during the first 14 days of storage. They want you to describe an experiment to investigate the change in vitamin C content when the fruits are stored for 14 days compared with 28 days. To be able to get valid results, we need to carry out experiments for 14 days as well as 28 days, but the fruits that we use should be the same. So I say to store two sets of fruits, some for 14 days and others for 28 days. The fruits must be from the same plant, of the same age, same mass, and they must be stored at the same conditions. For example, they should be stored at the same temperature and moisture content. To obtain the vitamin C extract, you need to crush the fruits after the intended storage time using the same extraction method, and this will give you the liquid extract. Then add the fruit extract to 1 cm cubed of DCPIP until the DCPIP solution turns from blue to colorless. You need to record the volume of the vitamin C solution that has been used to decolorize the DCPIP. In this case, this is V1, or I call it V1, which is going to be the volume of the fruit extract. So the volume and concentration of DCPIP should be maintained constant in all experiments. Also, in another test tube, you could put 1 cm cubed of DCPIP and add a standard vitamin C solution of known concentration. We can call this concentration C2 and then recall the volume that is required to decolorize the DCPIP. Call this volume 2. Then you calculate the concentration, which is C1, of the vitamin C solution using the formula C1 times V1 is equal to C2 times V2. After that, then calculate the change in vitamin C concentration and compare the results of the different storage times. In part C, vitamin C promotes the production of collagen to help the repair of human connective tissues. They want you to describe the structure of a collagen molecule. Here we are talking about a whole molecule. Collagen is a protein, so it's a polypeptide. And this polypeptide is made up of repeating sequences of amino acids, which are mainly glycine, and often to other amino acids, which could be proline, hydroxyproline, as well as arginine. The basic structure consists of a triple helix, or you could say triple alpha helix, and these alpha helices are held together by hydrogen bonds. The molecule consists of long collagen fibrils that create the fibrous structure. So any three points would award you three marks here. And this brings us to the end of question one. Let's continue to question two. In question two, the diagram shows a spirometer that can be used to investigate human lung function. So this is the spirometer. We can see the spirometer trace on the drum. We can see the container for the carbon dioxide absorber. There is an oxygen inlet, which is that. Then the mouthpiece, where the people or the participants are going to place their mouth as they breathe in and out. Then we have a counterbalance. We have a movable lead and a pen. A student used a spirometer to investigate the consumption of oxygen of a group of volunteers. Suggest so one risk that volunteer subjects might encounter when using this pyrometer and how the student could reduce the risk. The risk could be infection because they're all going to be placing this mouthpiece into their mouth and others could have breathing difficulties depending on how much the absorber of carbon dioxide is efficiently removing the carbon dioxide from the air they have to breathe in. So I wrote infection from the mouthpiece as well as breathing difficulties. And then they ask how the students could reduce the risk in this case, you could reduce the risk by replacing the mouthpieces after each volunteer uses the machine. And for the breathing difficulties, you could replace the carbon dioxide absorber 
after some time during the experimentation. In part B, the graph shows a spirometer trace from one volunteer breathing at rest. So we see from this trace the vertical axis is volume of air in decimeters cubed and the horizontal axis has time in seconds. We can see a line P to Q. This has been drawn for us. Down here they say the line PQ indicates the oxygen consumption. Calculate the rate of oxygen consumption between P and Q and they want you to give your answer with appropriate units. In this case, the rate is going to be the gradient of the line PQ. So I chose that point that has coordinate 6 and 1.6, and this other point here with coordinate 68, 1.2. So my rate, which is a gradient, is going to be 1.6 minus 1.2 divided by 6 minus 68. And of course, this is going to be a negative value, but of course, you're going to ignore it because it's a decrease. So I say it's 6.45 times 10 power negative 3. Again, this is going to be a negative value, and that should be my answer. But even if you do not include the negative value, either way, it's going to be a negative gradient. Then in part C, they say the student controlled several variables in this investigation. They say step two biotic variables that could affect this investigation. The age of the volunteers could affect the investigation because people with different ages have different lung capacities. Also, the gender could affect these two factors cause differences in lung capacity and that could affect the investigation. The next they say choose one of the variables you have identified in one and describe how this variable can be controlled. Subgender, use people of different genders. Then in part D they say describe how the ventilation center in the medulla oblongata controls the ventilation rate. Controlling the ventilation rate is to do with how the intercostals as well as the diaphragm work so here I said chemoreceptors in the blood vessels, of course, are going to detect the change in the blood pH. And when that happens, they send impulses through the sensory neuron to the ventilation center in the medulla. And from there, impulses are sent to the intercostals as well as the diaphragm. And if blood pH was low, the intercostals and the diaphragm will contract to increase the breathing rate in order to remove the carbon dioxide that is building up. So this brings us to the end of question two. Let's continue to question three. Question 3. The photograph shows a young locust eating the leaves of a plant. So this is the locust and these are the leaves that are being eaten. They say locusts can breed in large numbers and destroy crops such as sorghum in East Africa. A scientist observed that some varieties of sorghum were more likely to be eaten by young locusts. The scientist collected the seeds of two varieties of sorghum, which is sorghum A and B, and grew them in trays. Locust eggs were collected and hatched into young locusts. They said 20 young locusts were placed in a cage containing 100 grams of fresh sorghum leaves of variety A. The cage was kept at 30 degrees. And after 24 hours, the leaves were removed and the mass of the leaves eaten was calculated. The method was repeated with fresh sorghum leaves of variety B. And the method was repeated six times for these two varieties of sorghum leaves. The experiment was carried out at only 30 degrees, but we do not know if these conditions are the ideal conditions to maximize the experimental results. Also, the locusts were only exposed to the leaves for 24 hours, and this time may not be enough to make conclusive results. So the methods that could be used to improve the methodology based on the information we're given here is they could have allowed more time of exposure to the locusts, and they could have used different species of locusts. They could also vary the temperature. Instead of using 30 degrees only, they could use other temperatures. They could also expose the different varieties of sorghum to locusts at the same time to allow them to choose whichever sorghum variety they want to go to. And then they could also use locusts at different stages in development. So here the results are, we have the mass of leaves eaten by variety A and the mass of leaves eaten by variety B. So these are the results. In part A, they say state a suitable null hypothesis for this investigation. Because we are comparing two sets of data, I say there is no significant difference between the mean mass of leaves eaten by locusts from variety A and variety B. The next they say draw a suitable table to display the data and your calculated means for the mass of the leaves eaten for these varieties of sorghum. When you're showing results in the table, you have to make sure they are labels as well as units. So here I have mass of leaves in 24 hours in grams. And here I have my mean. There is variety A. These are the results and these are the results for variety B. You calculate the means by adding everything here from 17.3 to 16.9 and then divide by the number of experimental results that were collected. I did the same thing for B and here the mean is 17.1 while here the mean is 17.7.
In part C, they said draw a suitable graph to show the mean mass of leaves eaten by variety A and variety B, and they want you to include an indication of variability of the data. When they say include variability in the data, it means they want you to position the error bars. So based on the data, this is supposed to be a bar graph. And on the vertical axis, I have the mass of the leaves in 24 hours in grams. And on the horizontal axis, I have the variety of sorghum. This is variety A and variety B. And my mean for variety A is 17.1. We can see that one here. Here, my mean is 17.7. .7. The highest value for variety A is 17.5. And the lowest value is 16.7. Well, here, the highest value is 17.9. And the lowest value, which is this one here, is 17.4. So if you present your bar graph like that, you would get four marks. Usually this awards three marks. And in part D, they say the student analyzed the data using the t-test formula, which is given here, where x bar is the mean value of each treatment and is the number of samples for each treatment. These and that are given, and they want you to calculate the value of t. So I chose this to be 17.1 and that to be 17.7, .7, which I substituted for that and that here, and then divided through by the square root. Of this one squared divided by 6 plus that squared divided by 6 and I got negative 4.315 but I can ignore the negative and write this as 4.32 to three significant figures as my answer. The next part says the table shows the critical values of t for different degrees of freedom. The number of degrees of freedom can be calculated using that. So we know from the experiment there were six values so 6 minus 1 plus 6 minus 1 gives us 5 plus 5, which is 10. So we're going to get the results at degree of freedom equal to 10, which is this one here. And in biology, we collect data at p is equal to 0 0.05. So the corresponding critical value is 2.23. And down here, they say describe the conclusions that can be drawn from this investigation. Use the information in the table to support your answer. From the table, we can see the critical value is 2.23, while the calculated value is 4.32. Since the calculated value is greater than the critical value, we will reject the null hypothesis, and that means there is a significant difference between the mean masses of the leaves eaten by the locusts from variety A and variety B. In part E, they want you to describe how the student could extend this investigation to collect more data to either support or reject the hypothesis. Like I said previously, they could use various species of locusts, they could vary the temperature to obtain ideal conditions. They could use locusts at different stages in development, and they could expose the leaves to the locusts for more than 24 hours. That will give better results. In part F, some scientists predict that climate change will increase the destruction of crops in East Africa. So just one reason why some scientists think this. Climate change is mainly due to the increase in temperatures. So at high temperatures, the locusts will have shorter life cycles, and that means we'll have more cycles of locusts per year and more food will have to be consumed. So this brings us to the end of question three. Let's continue to question four. Question four, the photograph shows an aquatic plant, Cabomba aquatica, which is this one here. They say this plant grows in water in Asia. A student observed that the shortest plants were always seen in water shaded by overhanging trees. A student thought that reduced photosynthesis may be limiting growth of these plants. The student formed the following hypothesis. Low light intensity reduces the rate of photosynthesis in Cabomba aquatica. They wanted to plan an investigation to find the evidence to support or reject this hypothesis. And in your answer, you should give details under the following headings. In part A, they want you to describe the preliminary practical work that you might undertake to ensure your proposed method would provide quantitative results. In the preliminary practical work, you have to find ways of varying the independent variable. You have to find ways of measuring the dependent variable. You have to find suitable conditions like temperature, concentration of carbon dioxide, and so on, so that you have optimum results. So I said we need to find the suitable light intensity and methods to vary the intensity. We also have to find the suitable temperature and how it is going to be maintained. We have to find a suitable method to measure the dependent variable, like collecting the volume of oxygen produced and how the gas should be collected, meaning using a syringe and so on, and we have to find the suitable mass of the plants to be used. In part B, they say, devise a detailed method including how you would control and monitor important variables. To get the first mark, you have to state the dependent variable. 
you have to show how you're going to vary the independent variable. You have to show how you're going to collect the result or measure the dependent variable. You have to show how you're going to keep the specific conditions constant. And you have to say that you're going to allow the plant to acclimatize for each light intensity that you're going to vary. And then, of course, talk about repeating the experiment and so on. So I say the independent variable is the light intensity. This is not necessarily supposed to be said. And the dependent variable is the volume of oxygen produced per ton. This is a requirement. You have to write the dependent variable. And in this case, I said volume of oxygen produced per ton because this is to do with rate. Then carry out the experiment in a dark room at at least five different light intensities attained by placing a lamp at varying distances from the experimental setup. This is a method of varying the independent variable. So you have to get a suitable plant and place it under water to cut a suitable length. The plants should be the same species, they should be the same age. Actually, it's preferred to be coming from the same plant. Then connect the plant to a photosynthometer connected to a syringe to collect the oxygen produced. You have to use sodium hydrogen carbonate to provide the carbon dioxide needed for photosynthesis. This is going to be dissolved in the water. Then allow the plant to acclimatize before the results are gathered at the next light intensity. Collect the volume of gas produced per time. For example, this could be every 10 minutes and ensure that the temperature is maintained using a water bath. Then calculate the rate of photosynthesis by dividing the volume of gas produced by the time. And repeat the experiments at each light intensity and calculate the mean. In part C, they say describe how your results should be recorded, presented, and analyzed in order to draw conclusions from your investigation. You are not required to draw a table or a graph here. You are only required to write about it, but if you want, you can try to draw a sketch. So in my answer, I said you need to present the results in a table with labels and units. You need to include a column for repeats and calculate the means. Then present the mean values in an appropriate graph with labels and units. Then use a suitable statistical test like experiments to make a conclusion on the validity of the results. Finally, they say suggest two limitations of your proposed method. In the proposed method, it's going to be very difficult to efficiently collect all the volume of oxygen produced because some oxygen could dissolve in the water. And because we are using plants with different sizes of leaves, it's going to be difficult to control the surface area of the leaves exposed for photosynthesis to occur. So I say it is difficult to efficiently measure the volume of oxygen produced since some are dissolving the water. It is also difficult to control the surface area of the leaves. In lab experimental conditions may not necessarily mimic the actual growth conditions in the field or in the wild, so the obtained results could be different from the actual field results. So this brings us to the end of question 4 as well as to the end of this whole paper. Thanks for being with us. Do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.